Next piece in line is number 11, the crankshaft housing. Relatively straightforward little piece. I'm going to make sure that I am gripping it this way in the collet so that the large side is out. I will underturn this, undercut this, and turn that. Be careful not to run the smaller diameter through the bigger diameter. That could be a problem. I'm going to do that so that I can drill these out before I part it off. That's the only reason. So it's a 5 8 diameter stock, 625. I'm going to put it in the collet and have at it. You can technically do this with all with one tool, with the exception of the through bore, of course. You could face it, plunge the OD, plunge the undercut, plunge the other OD, and then take it to the mill. I'll probably do it with two tools just for sake of uh, not confusing things. All right, let's do it. Let's take it over to the mill, pop three holes in it, bring it back, part it off, call it done. Let's do it. Like a little Stanley Cup trophy, doesn't it? Part sitting vertically in the B block in the mill. Indicate the OD of the part. Make sure you are on location. Three holes.
I'm going to deburr the through hole, run it across some emery polish this side, and we'll try it on the front. Simple little piece. And a quick look at how that part goes on. Concentricity to the cast feature is ideal. No screws protruding through the inside. They're just about flush. And this takes the this takes the shaft and drives the gears on the inside. And I believe there's also an eccentric paw in here that, that drives back and forth and raises the, or excuse me, indexes the table as it moves. Fairly sure that's what that eccentric is for. Simple piece, another piece off the list. Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today's part is number 14. That is the elevating screw for the table. This little elevating screw right here, this component, will screw down to the section that you saw me shave out, broach out, and mill off on the base frame a while back. God willing. Once this thing is screwed down, it will line up with the cross hole in the table and accept this little 640 gear right here so everything operates as it should. Only way to get to it is just to get to it. Let's grab a piece of stock, put it in the lathe, and make this guy happen. For this particular part, I'm going to utilize a couple of different techniques. I'm going to leave the material hanging out at least 2 and 9 16 inches long, and I'm going to face it off. Come in and put a bump mark right there in the material, in the stock OD, which is 375, about just a little less than 10 millimeters. I'm going to put a little face mark in it right there. I'm going to put another face mark in it right there. And then I'm going to retract the entire material down inside the collet just to expose a little bit of this material at a time. I'm not going to use a live center. I'm not going to use a steady rest. I'm not going to use a follow rest. I'm going to creep the material out incrementally until I've reached the first hash mark that I put in there and I'll know that I'm at the one at 687. At that point I can thread it which I probably will do and as far as this angle is concerned since the angle does not deteriorate all the way down to the minor diameter or the major diameter of the thread I will probably just plunge it establishing my 5 16 diameter right here and then just back turn it use the back side of the tool and run it out hand blend it radius. So first thing I'm going to do is put the material in and I'm going to grip the material by the very end and make sure the material is not a banana. If the material is bent as you feed it out it will follow the arc of the bend and it will be very difficult to get this straight and to the dimension. Alright, first thing we're going to do, like I said, creep this out nice and slow, maybe half inch at a time. If I have to blend this at the end, I'll blend it at the end. But let's do the 1 inch 687 long 640 thread. First thing I'm going to do is see if the stock is bent. Be careful if it's been sheared or sawed. Make sure that the ends are nice and clean, free of burrs. Stick it in your collar. Fire it up and spin it. Watch for the end to run out. Knowing that the material is acceptably straight, I'm going to extend it, like I said, longer than the finished overall length of the part initially. And that is close enough. Going to dust cut the very end, zero out my digital. That little shoulder right there is the termination point of the thread, and when I get this diameter turned down to the 
three plus millimeter diameter that it has to go to, 136. I'm not going to want to touch off on the end for fear of having the part whip or grab on the tool. So I will have a face to target for and I can creep it out like I planned. Now the next face. Okay, the small diameter terminates here. The three degree taper, which is going to be here, originates here and bleeds down to this diameter. I'm not gonna use any other length measuring devices other than those two reference marks. Let's turn the front. With the diameter successfully turned, I'm going to set up a follow rest now so that I can thread it. I am going to do the thread inverted left to right, and this is a right hand thread, 40 threads per inch, 40 TPI. I'll be back. I'm all set up for the threading op. Like I said, I'm going to be threading from left to right, and the apparatus you see in the back is connected to my carriage. It strictly has a V-notch in the very front of it, and it's all made out of linen phenolic, and it is my follow rest. So as I thread this part, it will support the part and stop the part from deflecting away. The LE phenolic is extremely tough, but will yield, if there's some superficial burrs on this, it will imprint the phenolic, which is even better. So let's get to it. 40 threads per inch. And that is pretty small. See if we get the camera right down in there without getting in my way.
Okay, after a degree of off-camera shenanigans and swearing and kicking a few things across the floor, I have recovered from the oops. The very next pass after the flex did snap it off. I was very disappointed. And there's proof right there. Gone. In the garbage. Anyway, I'm all caught up. I did change the configuration of the follow rest. I am now supported on the rear and the bottom. I was set up for a left hand load and it got me. So let's continue with this. And I'm just about done. Hate when that happens. Threads are complete. Let's do the three degree termination point right there. I'm going to turn the diameter required at the termination point, stop the tool, and then compound the three degrees out. Part is turned, threaded, the taper is prepared, the radius, there's supposed to be a small radius right in this area right here. But before I cut this off and get this ready to mill, I'm going to prepare it to be cut and drilled from this side. Now this is a taper right here in the center and this is a very delicate thread on the end. So holding this several different ways, you could make a split collar, you could make a tap fit tapered bushing, but I'm going to make it a little bit easier, I'm just going to make a cup use a nut on this end to make this cylindrical so I can hold it in a V-block. Let's do that. The drawing calls for the straight shoulder to be 0 0.125. It's about three millimeters. I'm going to make mine about 190 just because the tangent point of the screws has the potential to break through the conical section and I would hate to see that happen. So I'm going to make mine a little bit longer. That's better too long than too short, right? You can always cut it off at the end if it's in the way.
Let's take a quick look at exactly what those components are that I just made. This is a small cup. Precision board on the end to be the same diameter as the termination point of the taper. Through hole is the major diameter of the thread. Effectively turning a tapered surface into a cylindrical surface. Much easier to hold. And the little nuts I saw me make was exactly that. A retainer. Easily squeezed in a V-block, held vertically in the vise. I can now drill and tap the two holes required in the end of this component. I think the benefit of this particular approach is fairly apparent. Once it's in the V-block, secured, I can adjust the length. I've used the exact same setup to face off the end before this operation. Just going to drill and tap two of the mounting holes in there and call this piece complete. Indicate the part, make sure the part is true, and zero out your dials and digital. I'm going to stick a shim of known thickness in between the part and the bottom of the drill because if I go beyond the parting line here, the chance of this drill breaking through to the three degree tapered cone that's hidden within this feature is pretty high. As a matter of fact, it's an absolute. I'm going to raise the table the thickness of that particular tool bit. The drill will now be exactly on the center of the top of that, or level with the top of this part, and I'm going to make the hole about 15 thousandths shallow of the thickness of that straight section right there. This is 190 thick. I'm going to go 175 on the thick. Drill some holes. And change over to a bottom tap, remove the part, finish tapping the pieces by hand. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. Okay, we're going to go over to the lathe, put this back in the collet like I did it, and give it a snap. Be right back. Okay, and we're back. Now, this little collar and slug is just one of many ways to do this, I am sure, so do it however you feel like doing it. But beware that if you drill those holes too deep, they will break through that taper, so be careful. 
is the upright that goes right there, so let's stick that on there and see if we get lucky. Well, there is a stop on the inside of this guy, and it's got to engage the inside of the casting here, so this has to be inserted in this before this is tightened to that. Let's go back in. Unloosen them screws. Ha <laughs> ha! Had to work that in there. These are 172 cap screws. Pretty small. Okay. Now ultimately, this little gear right here will sit inverted on the end of this screw. Like so, and go up inside of this pocket right here at assembly. It'll be trapped, and the screw coming across will also have a bevel gear on it driving the other one. So, as this one turns, this one will turn, and as this one turns, it'll consume the screw, and the table will go up and down. So, that's how that works. But it doesn't tell you on the print is this counterbore has got to match the back of this gear perfectly. That is a 250 counterbore. And lo and behold, this is a 252 diameter on the back of this gear, so that does not fit. Note to self, guys, if you're going to do this feature on this casting, make sure you have that bevel gear handy when you do it. So for now, I'm just going to check the alignment. Make sure everything goes together as planned. That's got to go through there. Yipper. Now this guy sits on here. And this goes back down to the bottom and gets screwed on. Let's do it. And there you go. I do not have the covers on these. When the covers are installed on this, they are extremely close to the face of this casting right here. And I think this is a very good prime example as to why these features and the features on the face must be symmetrical to the center line of the casting and nothing else. Whatever happens, happens. It's got to be symmetrical to the casting or all of the rails that go here will bump into the main body of the casting and the alignment of this particular elevator mechanism right here will not be symmetrical to the base as shown. So the call out on the print is for all of this milling, symmetrical to the body line, center line of the casting. It's right on the print. Do not deviate from that regardless of what you've been told or who you've been told by. Not a good idea, it will bite you and it will cause major league problems downstream. There you go. I think that's a win. It's starting to look like something now, I like it. I'm going to go back and cut that crown, that little bevel gear. I'm going to make that bevel gear fit on the inside of that casting, but I'll do that off camera. So we're going to call that one the end of this particular episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. The power is about to go out here in my shop. It is raining so hard outside I could probably walk across the parking lot and never touch the ground. So quit while I'm ahead. Stay well. Thanks for watching. Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out. And I'm smiling again. <laughs> you gotta love it. After checking all the mating components, the hole in the casting is just about 249.8. And these gears were 256. There's no way they were going together. So this was my fix. Took a small piece of brass that I had from the previous op, the one with the threads in it, 
put the tap back in and use the tap as the securing screw, making sure that the gear teeth themselves were running true because that's the most important part. So the tap was running true, the gear teeth were running true, and I trued up that back boss to fit inside the casting. That is a quick and dirty way to make a fixture if you need a screw that you don't have. Use the tap, just make sure the tap is running true. I've done it several times and it works.